Ick Radio Podcasts. Five Live Boxing. Uh, Hello and welcome to the Five Live Boxing Podcast with me, Steve Bunt. Another week, another week of fights, another week of seemingly endless talk about heavyweights. It's official. There is no new news about Tyson Fury and Dillian White, other than the fact that Tyson Fury now has an energy drink out called Ferocity. There's a plug. So, we move on. In this show, John Ryder joins us to talk about his emotional win over New York's Daniel Jacobs on Saturday night back at Alexander Palace. What a night it was. It was also one for the purists. And Natasha Jonas joins us to talk about her world title fight in Manchester this Saturday. Not at super featherweight, not at lightweight, but up at what we used to call light middle, which is now called super welter. It's a big jump. And we also hear, but of course we do, from Kel Brook and Amir Khan before their clash of the veterans. Long overdue, it has to be said. It's also in Manchester on Saturday. I'm joined this week by my favourite former WBO Champion, Mr. Barry Jones. Barry, first of all, what a couple of days, couple of weeks it's been in this boxing business. From a January that was dead to a February that just has not stopped. Well, from Cardiff for Eubank and Williams to, you know, to Ali Pally with Ryder and, and American star Daniel Jacobs. And then next week, we're back in Manchester with Brooke and Khan, a fight we never thought we'd see. And then Glasgow, then for obviously Josh Taylor versus Cattrall in a, a unification of, of all the belts and all British showdown. It's just unheard of, Steve. And it goes all the way through, I think, really, until we're, you know, we can literally plot our weekends all the way through to Amanda Serrano and Katie Taylor in what will be a sold out big house, 19,000 people at Madison Square Garden. It is quite relentless. You know, the, the weekend at Ali Pali. Now, Ali Pali is an odd venue, Barry. I don't know. If you've ever been to fights there, it's a strange venue. It works sometimes and it doesn't. Let's be absolutely honest. On Saturday night, it was, as they say, jumping. Some of that was the wrong football. Johnny Fisher, who does sell a few tickets. Ellie Scott, who fought for uh, an international title. She sells a few tickets. Don't get me wrong. But really, it was a sort of... It was a sort of homecoming in some ways for John Ryder, whose house is about three miles down the road. Now, John Ryder was fighting Daniel Jacobs. Now, Daniel Jacobs was known as the Miracle Man. Great story. Beat cancer. Back in the gym in a wheelchair. Back in the gym on crutches. Back in the gym on a walking stick. Back in the gym barely limping. Came back. Wins a world title. Wins another world title. And has great fights with great fighters. Like Sol Canelo Alvarez. Loses on points in Vegas. Uh, and like Gennady Golovkin. Loses on points to Gennady Golovkin. Uh, it, 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 in Madison Square Garden at the time, Barry. How about this? I'm, I'm not sure. I hope this is not nicking your first note. And I, and I didn't get this out when we were doing the broadcast on Saturday night. When Jacobs lost to Gennady Golovkin, Gennady Golovkin had, had was on a run of 23 consecutive stoppages on knockouts, and he hadn't gone the distance for nine and a half years. So Daniel Jacobs was some fighter. That was a good few years ago. It has to be has to be said. Um, what, before we speak to John Ryder, we'll get John up in a second. What were your impressions of Ryder and uh, and Jacobs before the first bell and during the fight, Barry? Before the first bell, I have to be honest. I thought if Jacobs had eighty percent of what he'd had, what he'd had, because but bear in mind, I, I I commentated on the on the Jacobs uh, Golovkin fight, and I thought Jacobs nicked it. Yeah, so did I. Yeah, I thought it was going to be a hard for Ryder to to close the distance. And to be honest, when the fight was happening, that the early rounds, it looked that way to me. After you know, those first five, six rounds, it looked like he was struggling to, to get close. Because it's easy to say you just got to put loads of pressure on Daniel Jacobs, but you just walk into shots. And so Ryder, yeah. a rider's intelligent enough and experienced enough to realise that. So he had to try and make Jacobs work without getting hit too heavy. Because Jacobs can punch, by the way. People think he's, he's yeah. predominantly a boxer, but he, he, packs a, he packs a bit of power. And then, obviously, the fight turned on its head in the second half. Where, where, you know, Ryder put his foot on the pedal, got, whether Jacob slowed down or whether all that, just putting pressure on, paid dividends, and and then made the fight very, very close in the end. Yeah, it was really close in the end. In fact, there was a little bit of uh, discussion on Twitter. And, and in fact, bro, we might have to do a, a specific show about social media reacting to boxing because I know that you've been on Twitter now on and off for about 10 years or so, but you yeah. have periods where you come off in disgust. You can't, you, you can know, I mean, you and I work together a lot, 
Uh, and there have been periods, sorry to get away from uh, Jacobs and Ryder, but no, it, it's, worth, it's worth discussing because it's a really important point. And I know John's going to bring it up when we talk to him. Um, it's that whole sort of concept that, of how much pressure the people on Twitter, which is the predominant boxing social media outlet, put on fighters and on referees and on judges and on trainers and on promoters. How, and I, want, I hate to use this word, but how? How influential they can be, and at the same time damning. Because you, you put, you know, you've walked away several times, haven't you? Then you, yeah, you reluctantly off. come back. Well, I actually went off for two years, Steve, for a two-year period. I just had enough, of, and it wasn't negative comments from my, of, about myself. It was just every morning going on, listening to people slagging other fighters off, or referees, judges, the sport in general, and you no, know, I just. You need it out of your life. All that negative thought just affects everybody. And I imagine for fighters themselves, when they when they wake up in the morning, they look at their phone and there's just people saying, you know, you didn't win that. or It's not your fault, by the way. You don't judge your own fights. That's what I would say. Don't blame Absolutely. the fighter if he gets a decision that you disagree with. And, but, but that's just how it is, unfortunately. And, and But it's, it's difficult and it's hard. But you know, they've also grown up in it. So it's, their, it's, their, their, it's something that they have to just either just blank or get used to. Anyway, that's a discussion for another day, but this should be about this should be about John Ryder beating beating the great Daniel Jacobs. And I'm gonna stick with that because Daniel Jacobs' record and his achievements were quite exceptional on both sides of the ropes. Anyway, John can join us now. John, listen, thanks for joining us, John. Um uh, I hope we haven't, you know, in, in ended your weekend of relaxing. John, on Saturday night, you were understandably emotional in the ring when I got up. To talk to you, has it sunk in yet, John? Yeah, I mean it's a it's a fantastic feeling. Obviously, Danny Jacobs had a, had a fantastic career. Listen, he's had he's he's got a fantastic story inside and outside of boxing. I think he carries himself so well and so eloquently. And I think um, this is one of them where it's it's great to have his name as a scalp on my record now, and and join a, a list where he's only been beat by the likes of Canelo and, and Golovkin. So that's that's a big plus, but. Um, I'm not going to kid on and, and say that I beat the same Danny Jacobs that, that Canelo and Golovkin did. Um, father time waits for no man. And I think it even more so inactivity has played a big part. He's, he's been active, inactive now for, I think, about 16 months. And listen, I feel yeah. it myself. Um, I haven't had a, a lackluster, uh, well, a slow two years. Um, we need to be active. And, and obviously him kind of a 16-month layoff, me... I think about six months. I think it shows in there. But John, in all fairness, there were moments there when it was the old Danny Jacobs, when he was showing your shots, leading you into traps, and making you miss, and 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 and, and boxing well for six rounds. Just because you you tracked him down over the last six, there was still enough Danny Jacobs in there, John. Yeah, there was, and I mean, I was quite surprised. I mean, um, his, his power was was reason, was reasonable. I think maybe speeds diminished a bit, but um, like I say, these these old school American fighters, they're always setting traps and always three or four steps in front on, on things they're going to do. And I feel more mentally drained these last couple of days since the fight, just thinking how, how switched I had to be for the full 12 rounds. And I mean, mm. physically, I'm, I feel like I've been hit by a bus, but mentally I feel I feel wrecked because it was such a, a high-driven, high-focused fight that you just couldn't switch off in there at all. And John, just briefly before Barry comes in, the it was a tight, it was tight, it was a split decision, seven five for you, seven five for him. As you were going into the last two or three rounds, in your head, and you're you know you're a straight guy, and you've been in enough fights. Did you think you were a round up, or, or or it was close going into the last couple of rounds? I, I didn't really know. I mean, there was there was no real urgency in my corner. You know, what Tony's mm. like if he, if he feels that it's we're slipping behind, he'll he'll have a foot up my backside and. Uh, I'll be, I'll be coming out for all guns blazing. But I think, you know, from the past, as the rounds go on, I kick on and, and that's when I start building up. And I think, yeah, I think maybe I lost the last round, but the, the, the last three of the last four, I won, won well. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, got, got my nose in front and got the win. John, I was watching, the, the fight was a fight of two halves, as of course, everyone's saying that. But did you feel that you just had to just stay with him in the first half and, and make him work harder than he wanted to? Yeah, I think the initial plan was, I think we know that he likes to fight at his pace and he, he's very good at... Uh, uh, that's one thing I, was, I didn't realise how good he was at setting that pace and making you stay to it. I mean, there was times when I tried to pick it up, but 
he just slows it down again and he's he's got that's a, a great quality a great attribute but um early doors I wanted to tie him up a bit and, and get my work off on the inside and, and try and work away up close but he had other plans and he was tying me up straight away so that was a, a bit of a pain but uh, it worked well um, still the same game plan kick on the second half of the fight and, and get the win was, it, was there an urgency after those six rounds to, to put your foot on the pedal because you did dramatically up the pace or, or did you slow him down I think more so that I slowed him down I think um up, up to round three, I was very much just single shots. Then I started putting on the skeleton of the body a bit more. Um, I think he he was always, I mean, he's 35 now, not that, not that I'm much younger, but trying kind to of slow him to the body. Um, and I think it showed the second half of the fight, he did he did slow down dramatically. And um, I had some good success in, in rounds seven, eight and nine and landed some big shots. And listen, a lot of the rounds were close and it's, it's what you favour. But I think a lot of the rounds that I won in the second half were were big, conclusive winning rounds. Um, and the, the, I mean, the earlier rounds were were subjective, and I mean, depends what you like. But they were they were close. I think I don't know what the uh, the score system was, but I, I feel like I won, and I, I won pretty well. Well, I'll tell you what the score system was, John. All three judges gave him round one and round two. And all three judges gave you rounds seven, eight, and nine. And the other seven rounds were split between the judges. That's the type of fight it was. As you say, it was a fight that was decided by one shot here or two shots there. Uh, apart from seven, eight, and nine, which, as you said, and I think we all agree, everybody agrees, you, you know, you, you pulled away. And he, lo he looked distressed. I mean, there was a point there in seven and eight when he did not look very comfortable in front of that rabid crowd. Yeah, I mean, especially as well, like, what he's achieved in this sport and what he's, he's done. And it's at times I thought, will he have any desire now to continue if it gets tough in there? And I think that it showed he has. He's after round seven yeah. and eight, it was, there was heavy rounds. And then round nine, again, another heavy round. I think I, I took round 10 off a bit because I, I, I thought this, he might go and just come and try, come out flying here and try and finish me off. And if, if, if he's got anything left, he'll have a go. If not, it'll, it'll be all right. And, I mean, he come out for the first bit and nothing really. So we just kicked on and carried on boxing. But listen, like I say, Danny Jacobs has been a great fighter throughout this sport for the last however many years. And uh, it's a real honour to have shared a room with him and to especially have beaten him. I know that wasn't a world title fight, John, but did, did it sort of feel like that? Because, you know, you've had a you know, you've had a career where you've had to do it the hard way. You've had you no know, setbacks and you've come overcome them and you've, and you've re regrouped and come on and, and performed better. Actually, you performed better in sort of the last third of your career to date than you did earlier on in your career. You've looked a different fighter. Did this feel like you getting over the line at last? Yeah, it did. I mean, it felt much bigger than the Callum Smith fight. I mean, obviously, I know there was a world title on the line, but this felt huge for me. It felt massive. It felt like really my last chance saloon. And I think, like I said, I mean, it wasn't the, the grandstand blockbuster finish that I'd hoped for or would have liked, but we got the win and that was the most important thing. I, I can go on to fight another day. And I mean, I put a lot of pressure on myself in the build up saying that if I had, I'd lost this fight and or the loser had nowhere to go. And I stand by that. I think it was, was especially for me, I've not got the record or the resume Danny Jacobs has got. I can't go and fight Jake Paul for <laughs> 5 million. Uh, it'd have been curtains to me. I'd have been, I'd have been true, yeah. looking for a job. So um, I think yeah. I've lived to see another day now and hopefully get another big fight. But, Listen, there's options out there for Danny Jacobs. He's still a, a great, a great name in a sport. And listen, I hope he doesn't get used as fodder, but he can go out there and fight a YouTuber or a celebrity or whatnot, and still earn a truckload of cash. Absolutely, and, and why not? And, and that's a you know, I tell you, you've come up with a fight there that's one that Eddie might be thinking about because that, that, that it, it, bizarrely, Jake Paul against Danny Jacobs makes a lot of sense. Uh, John, let me ask you this: He left the ring uh, straight after. There's nothing, nothing wrong with that. Did you speak to him either in the dressing rooms or back at the hotel or afterwards? Did you get a little bit of one-on-one -on -one time with him? I saw him briefly in the dressing room after we we got a picture and had, had a, a little chat. But listen, there was no complaints from his side. Um, they wished me well and, and and congratulated me. So. All these shots of robbery and and whatnot, um, they're not coming from his camp. So, if uh, all these people on all these keyboard warriors on Twitter and whatnot, just l let me enjoy my night. It was a great win. Great to have an American legend over here in the ring to share. Uh, let's just let's just go on and embrace it. Yeah, we've been we've been building up this fight, and and we've been building up, John. And I told you this when I spoke to you in the gym on on. Um... 
on Wednesday. Now, this fight was about, no disrespect to you, it was about this American legend fighting him, a living, le you know, a living legend, a great fighter, and, 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 and he was putting it on the line, and you were you were sort of big enough to stand up, so it was perfect. The build-up was brilliant. The result, I thought, the, the result, no problem at all with that. It was a, it was a real tight one in, in every which way, and, and the fact that three of the judges gave you all three, gave you those three rounds, all of them scoring for you, shows you that. John, what, what might be next? There's all sorts of bold talk. There's all sorts of, there's all sorts of talk. What about, what about you? What would you like, John? No one seems to have asked you what you would want. Yeah, I, I just really don't know. I mean, obviously you've got to expect that there might be a final eliminator for a WBA title. So I don't know who would be in line for that, but I'm more than happy to do so. Um, obviously everyone wants the, the, the Canelo shot, but, I'm not too sure he knows what he's doing next. He's got loads of options yeah. and whatnot. But listen, hopefully in time that the belts can fragment and we can all get a shot at a vacant title or whatnot. But failing that, I'd like a shot at the likes of the plants, the Benavides, just um, fights that we can not, they're not keep busy fights, but they're, they're good, hard, meaningful fights worthy of a world title like Saturday night was. And the thing is, Barry, I don't know if you agree with this, but I, I, I mean, it's my theory, is that now you've now you've achieved what you've achieved with Danny Jacobs, if you fight one of those guys, a Benavidez or a Caleb Plant, okay, if you were to lose that, it's not the end of the road. If you were to lose a fight like that, you can move to the left, you can move to the right. So I agree with your assessment, John, that the, the other night, for you, if you'd have lost... You would have found yourself in not a dark place, but you would have found yourself with far fewer avenues to go down. Now that you've beaten Daniel Jacobs, it's, it, everything's opened up for you. Yeah, no, it's I true. Think... I mean, uh, I invest so much in camp. Um, we've got SNC coaches, nutritionists, and stuff. And I mean, you're, you're working off a of minus before you've even stepped in the ring. So these people need paying. So you, you can't be going into a yeah. six and eight round fight. I think for me, the, the whole crew of the sport is if you would have lost on Saturday, then as good a fighter you are, you're the guy who lost to Callum Smith, whether it was right or wrong, that's, all, that's the, what the record says, and a guy who lost to Daniel Jacobs. And then you, you do have places to go, but you're literally having to fight every up-and-coming superstar to try and get back into the mix. That's how it would be for you, unfortunately. That's how horrible the sport is. But now you have a name over in America. You just be Daniel Jacobs. It doesn't matter if he's, like you said, it's not the, the Jacobs who lost to Golovkin, but he's still a good Daniel Jacobs. And he's a name. And he's still world rated. He's still good enough to be a world champion. So all of a sudden, no, you are in that mix with those names. You no, know, you and Benavidez, all of a sudden, it's a fantastic fight. I mean, what a fight that is to watch, by the way. No, maybe not for you to be involved in, John. Could it be a hard scrap? But <laughs> for us for us at home watching, it would be a fantastic fight. So you know, all of a sudden, and that's how cool the sport is, Steve. You know, you go from Yeah, you know, now, now he's on now he's now he's in he's in the mix with all these names, or if but if that would have gone his way Saturday night, you know, there's a he's right on the bottom of the ladder and, and do you rebuild or do you pack it in? It's it's that sort of sport. It's true. I mean it, it's a cruel sport and I've had to rebuild on occasions before and I think at, at my age now of 33, it's like, like I say, coming back to six and eight rounders, trying to build up, being used as fodder for upper comers, it's tough and I've got I've got a partner and two children and it's, it's how long I can put them through it. So, listen, we, we got the win set my, um, my my place in the sport is still justified and I've earned myself a few more years in the sport. Listen, John, you did us proud on Saturday night. Everyone seemed to like it. It was, a, it, was a, it was an awful lot of fun. It was a great atmosphere. And what's more, you get to do the pod on a Monday in your silk pyjamas from your bedroom. I mean, it, it's just about the ideal way to go to work, isn't it? Eh? It's not like, I, I can't that. get out of the front door for moving for Christmas, for his Valentine's Day card. So, uh... I'm the same, son. I'm the same. I'm the same. What do you do, eh? John, listen, thanks so much for your time. Well done. Congratulations. Speak to you soon. John Ryder, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Good to see you. Thank you, Barry. Nice to see you, mate. See you, mate. So John Ryder there, a winner by a split decision over Daniel Jacobs on Saturday night. In fact, everybody seemed to be split a ringside. Some had it one round this way, having scored one round a draw, and a lot of people had it 7-5, seven, 7-5 five, seven, five this way, 7-5 that way. Um I, I don't listen, I don't I don't think it was an outrageous uh, screamer. Barry, I'll ask your opinion of the judges. At the scores, and, and if there's anything we can do to maybe explain to, to more of the boxing public how the judges come about getting their scores. But let me just explain. It was a an eliminator, not a final eliminator. Uh, he talked about that there, uh, John. It was a an eliminator for the WBA regular title. Sol Canelo Alvarez owns the super title. So Sol Canelo Alvarez owns the WBA super, super middleweight title, which, of course, is a ridiculous title, but hey-ho. So Sol Canelo Alvarez 
has all four belts, including the WBA Super version. But it's a man called David Morrell who owns the uh, WBA regular version, and he's got a fight coming up against Adis Yerbos Nuli. Um, that and this was an this was an eliminator to fight the winner of the the Morrell Yerbos Nuli fight. Now, of course, let's be absolutely brutally honest here. Morrell and Yerbos Nuli, you know, they're, they're good fighters. They're quality fighters. John Ryder's at that stage in his career where he's looking for fights. He talked there about Benavidez. He talked there about Caleb Plant. And why not? That's the business. That's the business of promoting. And, and that's the business of boxing. The business of boxing is not to fight someone who no one really knows in some obscure venue and get beat. It's that simple. That, that, that's the bottom line. You know, this, is, this is a business sport, a sporting business, whichever way you want to look at it. Barry, the scores were, uh, as, as I've said, they were tricky in some ways. And I'll just give you a, a quick little taster. In rounds one and two, all three judges scored them in favour of Jacobs. In rounds seven, eight, and nine, all three judges scored in favour of Ryder. So that's five rounds where the judges were unanimous in their decision making. However, in the other seven rounds, okay, the judges were split in every single round. So that's a 7-5 split. So is it any wonder we've got a split and we've got a, a, a massive divide amongst boxing people? I, it's crazy, isn't it? I, I would say they, they all have different... The reason why judges are spread around the ring is they all have a different vantage point to the action. So you see different things at different times. So I understand why you can have a different perspective. But the criteria of how you score a fight is, very, is more complex than what we feel. I do think that for the public's sake, uh, broadcasters should give an outline of how a fight is scored, a criteria for scoring. It's not point. all just about aggression. It's not all just uh, punches landed. Or they are the main criteria, of course. Certainly punches landed is. But it still goes down to preference. It still goes down to um, what you prefer. Do you prefer seven light shots or one heavy shot? And and, and, and that's how, how you see that, how, how the impact that, that one punch has to over those seven flurries, punches and flurries of punches. It's it's a difficult thing to, you're never going to get a spot on as you go to computer scoring, which makes it a, well, it almost ruined amateur boxing, didn't it? Let's be honest. So that doesn't work at all, Steve. I don't know, well, but the one thing I would say, Steve, is how do they get it? There's no, no people are going back to half a point system and no, because you no. Sometimes a, a dominant round should be a 10-8 rather than a 10-9, but then a knockdown would make that a 10-7. And or does a knockdown? You no, know, it, it's some people's got on. Only you give the guy winning by one point. It's it's, it's yeah, complex. I'm, I'm wondering if we're coming to that stage where we have a fourth judge who sits in arbitration. Hey ho, you never know, do you? That, that, that which is what they have. Stop, stop it, the now, Steve. The stop it. Okay, stop it. I thought I thought I'd drop that little baby. <laughs> right, Barry. It's finally on. We've been waiting well, filling the gap. Six years, seven years, eight years, nine years, ten years, whatever. It doesn't matter. <laughs> because this Saturday in Manchester, Kel Brook, 35, will fight Amir Khan, 35. They sparred together when they were 16, 17 or 18, depending on who you want to listen to. And Amir smashed Kel to bits or Kel smashed Amir to bits. Take your pick. Barry, they're finally fighting. What, first of all, what was your first reaction when you found out or you heard about, back in about November that Brooke and Khan would actually be fighting? That won't happen. <laughs> that was my first thing. <laughs> that's not going to happen. Not in a million years that's going to happen because we've been waiting for so long. that it, so In the long. end, you just got bored of hearing about it, didn't you, for a, for a while. But, but now it's here. It's a weird fight, Steve, this, because it's here. And for me, it's almost... Two retired fighters boxing. That's all. That's it's almost that way. Let's be honest. And it almost yeah. has no relevance over the world scene. It yeah, will. I, I, it will because of their big names. But I mean, in many ways, it doesn't. But I can't wait to see it. I, I I've gone full casual on a fight that has no no that 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 really is is, is eight years past its sell by date. And I just yeah. so st excited, so stoked, and so jealous for anyone who's going to be in Manchester. Let me just give you a couple of brief facts before we hear a couple of interviews from the pair of them. Um, Kell Brooks fought 42 times, won 39, lost three. He's 
Been a pro since 2004. Won a world title in 2014. He's now 35. Amir Khan has had 39 fights, 34 wins, five defeats. Um, he's been a pro uh, since 2005 after the Athens Olympics where he got a silver medal. He's 35. He won his first world title in 2009. Amir Khan. Kell Brook, two men who have topped the bill. I, I can't even do the sums on how many times they've <laughs> topped the bill on our Saturday night boxing viewing. But it's probably somewhere in the region, somewhere in the region, and I kid you not, Barry, it's somewhere in the region of 55. Now, that is obscene. I, I reckon, I mean, yeah. Amir's always been the top of the bill, even though uh, officially he wasn't the top of the bill, but his debut, professional debut was in Bolton. He was the top of the bill. <laughs> Forget who was the top of the bill. He was the top of the bill. So, Barry, what we're going to do, we're going to listen to a couple of interviews, one with uh, Kel Brook and one with Amir Khan. Now, these interviews have been done by Eleanor Roper, who made a brilliant little film about Dillian White several years ago, which talked about his struggles to get a world heavyweight title fight. She made it about four years ago, and trust me, it hasn't changed. <laughs> it's, it's, it's completely up to date, but that's neither here nor there. Anyway, Eleanor caught up with the pair of them. She went all over Britain and to, 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 to finally get together with them. And here she is talking to Kel Brook about a fight that uh, it's obvious, it's obvious he's wanted with a man. It's obvious he doesn't like. I just don't like his attitude. I don't like... His lies because there's like certain things what me and him are like with sports each other, and then he comes out of the interview and just lies, you know. Lies. Can you give us an example? Like, what, like what's he's he saying about? that we had a chat and he said that it's 100 percent on this for a long time ago when we were talking together. You no, know, like I said to you, how many times I've been in his company and at the the press conference last, you know, last and we were ringside together and we got together and he said this fight's definitely going to happen, shut me and, you know, had his word and all this. And then he comes in an interview saying that I didn't want it. I think the boxing world know that I've always wanted this fight. I won the world title against Sean Porter. The camera got put on me. I've got a cut on me. I've just won the world title. He were commentating in Sky and I, I said, let's do it. You know, I, I've always wanted this fight. So oh, I remember you sa saying that. When yeah. he says that I, it's me what's never wanted it, it just riles me. Because you know, everyone knows it's not true. He, he knows it is. And he's done many things like that, That's and as well as not giving me no respect and he can beat me one hand and I'm levelled below him. It, like someone who's competitive, who wants to win at snooker, table tennis, anything. And I mean, this is my sport I've done since I was nine year old. You know, him saying he's better than me. Like that, that's just in me that it, it, it's, I'm not going to be his best friend. I don't like him and he does not like me. And it's, it's, a, serious, it's a serious grudge match. What do you make of Amir's career? I think he's had an amazing career. I think he's, you know, he's one day went to, went to the Olympics and did very well, got silver, and it won. He's never, you know, he keeps going on, but he's never won a world title at welterweight. But he's he's won, he's won, he's become two time maybe a world champion at like like welterweight. He's been in some big fights. He's done very well. He's very well known. So respect and credit to him. Anyone what gets in that ring and puts a pair of gloves on, you've got to take your hat off to him because when. It's just you in there on your own, you know. So you do admire what, what he's yeah, achieved. Yeah, of course I do. I've always given him his his due. He hadn't done it to me, you know. He's he's done well, but I need to. But he's obviously aware where the fair is. What do you see as as his strengths? Speed. I think he's he's obviously he's got very fast hands. You know, he's he's, he's quite fast on his feet. You know, but he's a good fighter. But I don't. He's not on my level. How do you counter that speed? Because I think when we talk about this fight, everyone says we know that you carry a lot of power. Amir is a fast boxer. We know that. How do you approach the fight with that in mind? Timing. You know, timing. That timing beats speed for me. You know, time is shots. And I always seem to find a way. You know, if, you know, if, I, if I can't get in, I'll find a way. I always find a way to, to win and to get my shots off. And we're in there for a, for a long time. We're in there for 12 rounds. You know, so there's going to be at some point where we have to exchange, and you know, it's going to be, there's going to be a lot of drama in the fight. It's going to, it's going to be it's going to be an unbelievable night, and I can't wait to feel the atmosphere from the fans. You know, I can't I can't not wait. What would you say are his weaknesses? His whiskers, his chin. You know, I think that the <laughs> the world knows that his chin's not the you know the the, the, the strongest part on him. Why now? Why, why are you taking this right now? And, and a cynic would say, is it that both you and Amir are looking for, you know, a big yeah, payday? Yeah, that's what, of course, we're after a payday. That's, you know, it's, you know we're prize fighters at the end of the day, but 
I just think that there's nowhere for him to go. You know, he's avoided this like the plague for years, and he don't. Nobody wants to see him in America fight. You know, and I think that the biggest money fight, and you, you know, I've heard that he's uh, him and his wife are high main, maintenance. You know, they, you know, so he's got to keep them pennies in, hasn't it? And uh, I think this is the biggest fight out there for him. And he thinks that I'm over early. Don't th he thinks that you know I'm, I'm a shell of myself, but I feel 23 again. So Barry, a very focused sounding Kell Brook. And you can't disagree with anything Kell Brook says there, Barry. It, it, it's that simple. I mean, every single thing he said there is is true. Yeah, and what he says about speed is something that, that I've always sort of um, signed up to, was, is that good timing always beats blind speed. And I think that's what Amir Khan has. He has that blind speed where sometimes he throws without thought because his hands are so fast and they are so fast that he can get away with lots of things. Because he throws them long, Amir Khan, as well. He doesn't throw them short, so he, he gets away with stuff. But I think with great timing, can can counteract that. But does Brooke have that timing that he had in the past? And also, when you go down to resumes, you know, we're trying to, you're trying to look at who's going to win the fight now because they're not the same fight as they were. And you go down to resumes, Cairns is so much deeper than, than Brooks. He's been in with punches that he's overcome and lost against, let's be honest. But... He, he does get hurt on the whiskers, but he is brave enough to throw when he's when yeah. when he's in that fire line, which can also and by the way, Can can punch himself. I think Brooks the big Brooks the puncher out of the two, but he is a he can punch Steve. Yeah, it's very overlooked, uh, Khan's power. I completely agree. Right, so before we discuss the actual fight and the ins and outs of when it should have happened, when it didn't happen, and what could have happened, and what didn't happen then, and might happen now, why well, oh, we're nearly there. It's the fight. It's fight week. They step into the ring about ten o'clock on Saturday in Manchester. Sold out. Sold out in minutes. Let's hear from. Amir Khan. And just like Kel, you know, he's been having thoughts, having dreams and wanting to get in the ring with Kel for a very long time. A lot of people feel that I was always avoiding it, but I never was because it just at the time when we both wanted it, uh, I, there was interest in it. I was never, I was always campaigning in America. I was fighting the big names in America, in America fighting the world champions, defending my world titles. It was just that when um, he started talking more about it, I thought, you know what, it is a good big fight in the UK, especially. It'd be massive, not in America. But when I was making big, big, having the big fights in America, I thought there's no point in me coming back to UK. That Kelbrook fight will always be there, and I knew one day in my life it's going to happen. I would never leave the sport without that fight happening. So then, obviously now, it's so you to thought that stage. I can, you thought I can go away and do yeah. the things I want to do because Kel's always going to be there. Correct, hundred percent. I mean, I don't know if that's the wrong thing to say, but I mean, it was just because I thought. That, look, people like fighters like Terence Crawford, fighters like Maidana, Zab Judah, they're not going to be there all the time. And I might not ever get the opportunity to fight them guys. But with, with Kel, he's always going to be there. He's a British fight. And even if he retired, he'll come back out of retirement and just take that fight. You know, that's, a, that's how much he's wanted it as well. So I thought, look, that fight will happen when it happens. And, it, and it's now it's made. And it's even bigger than ever because I think people have waited that long for the fight that in six minutes the fight sold out. And it just shows how much interest there is in, in this fight. Why don't you like Hellbrook? What don't you like about well, him? Well, to be honest with you, I keep saying I don't, I, don't, I don't like him, but to be honest with you, I don't, um, I, I mean, I, I don't really not not like him, you know what I mean? He's, there's nothing There's nothing there really that I'm angry about. I want to just hate a bit the things that he says, like I'm, I'm not, the respect he's never had for me. But then again, I don't know he has respect for me, but really he tries not to make, show that. But I think he's got, he's, Look, he said he respects you. He, 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 said, he said, I respect him as a yeah, fighter. You've yeah, achieved an enormous yeah. amount. I think it's just that, you know, I think as time's gone on, we just probably, I don't know, I think he just lived off my name all, all his career, really. And kind of just gets me a little bit angry and stuff, thinking, why is he always calling me out? Even times when he knew I was fighting someone else, he still called me out, talked bad about me. But it made, it made the fight happen, didn't it? So, I mean, whatever he said... It worked. What do you make of him as a fighter? What do you see as his strengths? I respect him as a fighter. Look, at the end of the day, he's been a world champion. He's fought the best out there. Um, he won a world title against Sean Potter. Sean Potter is a very good fighter, and he beat him. His strengths are he's a, he, he comes forward, likes to pressurise his fighters. He throws a lot, a lot of punches. He's very powerful, very slick, and has great movement. So he's got everything that... To, you know, he's got everything as a, as a, that a great champion should have. What doesn't he have? What are his weaknesses as you see I them? I think it's hard to say. You know, at the end of the day, look, if, whenever someone wins a world title, is is you have to respect him for that. But I just don't think he has the the heart anymore, the heart 
that he had maybe five years ago is not there anymore. I think he now takes a knee and like how he gives up in fights. I think that's what he'd probably do against me once I put that pressure on him. He thinks that your chin is your weakness. What yeah. would you say to that? Yeah, I mean, look, end of the day, you're not in boxing. If you can get hit with a good shot, you're going to go down. Obviously, I'd be off, gone up and down weight divisions for big guys like Canelo. Obviously, you're going to get hit. If you get hit clean by a bigger guy, you can get knocked down. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's the only advantage he's got on me, he thinks. But to be honest with you, I really believe that Kel can't take a shot at I think his chin is really bad compared to when it comes to... I mean, look, I've seen him be hurt by it with a jab. I've seen him be put down. In the last couple of fights, he's been put down. He's been hurt quite badly. And obviously, them, them eye sockets. You, you have heard about the problems he's had in his previous fights, having both eye sockets um, fractured. One was against Golovkin, the other one against Spence. I mean, look, he's, he's in a position where he's, you can get hurt really badly. But at the end of the day, look, I'm going to put that to a side. I'm just going to go in there and do what I do best. And if I hurt him, I hurt him. Uh, but I can't see him beating me in this fight. So two interviews, two very honest interviews, two very blunt interviews there by Eleanor Roper. And again, just like I said with, with Kel, you can't disagree with anything that Amir says. And if anything, those two interviews have set the fight up. Um, they've, made, they've made me fancy it even more, Barry. You sort of can um, disagree with with can't you can't disagree with can that yeah. you know, he is the A side. It's just that's yeah. how it is. He is the he is the, the A side because you know, the Olympics and 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 the, and the following he's had since then. But it, I was going to ask you, Steve. Do you think this fight is about who's deteriorated the least, or is it still a fight that's worthy to be judged on their ability? Yeah, I think uh, you you it's it's judged on their ability at this level. But then the the asterisk attached to that is quite simple. Who's faded the most? And maybe one way to look at who's faded the most is to look at basically their last two fights or their, their, you know, their last fight. I know Khan had a ridiculous fight out in the, the Middle East. I'm not <laughs> counting that. But Khan's last real fight was April 2019 when he lost to Crawford. You were ringside, Barry. Yeah. Madison Square Garden. And Brooks' last fight was in a bubble, a really sterile bubble at the MGM in Las Vegas in November 2020 uh, when he lost to Terence Crawford. So they both lost to Terence Crawford. Amir Khan was doing very well and then suddenly uh, just got got caught and got hurt and that was all over in the sixth round. He, 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 he kind of fell apart a little bit, but he was there. Um, and, and Kel was not really in the fight. It was a really bizarre fight. And then he just suddenly got caught and dropped and hurt and stopped in, in the fourth round. So if you look at those two, who's... Who... Who put up yeah. the best performance and who do you think has lost the most since then? I was quite concerned by Brooks' capitulation against yeah. Crawford, more so than I was with Carnes 18 or so months earlier. But the, the, the worry for me was Carnes was uncharacteristic. Yes, no, I agree. To him, because he's, he's a kid who's been too brave for his own good too many times and he wasn't in that fight and yeah. and listen, you, if anyone deserves a deserves a break, deserves a, 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 a get out of free a get out of jail free card, it's it's Amir Khan, of course. But there was a sign there with that age and this stage of career, do you need another hard fight? To get, yeah. you know, no, and same with Brooke. You know, I think since the damage from the Golovkin fight, there's maybe in the back of his mind, subconsciously maybe, a worry for your health. And I just, as much as you know, you have to be defend yourself at all times in boxing. If you go into a fight actually worrying about your health, Steve, yep. then you're never fully committed, and that, that's just that's just the truth. So it's a uh, yeah. yeah you like you said, there's loads of tangibles in there, loads of loads of things attached to the fight of how it'll go on. I think with ability alone, I think the styles gel because because uh, Kell Brooks a master of make of drawing you in. You know, so you so you overreach, and that's when he catches you. And Amir Khan has so f- blistering fast hands, and and keeps the punches long. That you no. Know, Cal Brook might find that a nightmare also. Uh, I, just two things. I'll just, just point out that I got up in the ring after he lost to, after Mamir Khan lost to Terence Crawford and Virgil Hunter, who was his trainer at the time, he's now with uh, Brian McIntyre, BMAC as he's known, the guy that works with Crawford. That's who Khan's with now. But I got up in the ring after after that fight, Barry, and Virgil Hunter, who was his trainer at the time, was as was as bemused as yeah. and confused as most of us were, as was Khan. But perhaps that was just simple. You know, he knew he was coming to the end of his career. He was probably 33 at the time or 32 and a half at the time. And maybe he was just conservative. Because he could have gone on, as you said, the old Khan would have gone another three or four rounds, been dropped a couple of times and rescued bravely in the ninth. So perhaps he got out of that fight to live to fight 
another day. Let me ask you this question, Barry. Had this fight happened six or seven years ago, okay, who who would have won this fight in 2014? Let's say after uh, after Kel won the world title in 2014, um, Amir was just about to beat Louis, Louis Colazzo in Las Vegas for the WBC silver uh, belt at Welter, which was a which was a good enough win. So it's around that time. Who would have won in 2014? Well, you 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 would have had to have favoured Brook because he comes off that tremendous win, though a close win. And yeah. it was it was it was only a few fights ago where, where Amir Khan lost two on the spin with Lamont Peterson where he got out roughed. Let's be yes. honest, because you know because Khan still never learned how to fight inside amazingly how well he's done. And Danny Garcia where he got where he got chinned in four rounds, but Danny Garcia at the time was was absolute, was one of the pound for pounds. Yeah. And so you would have said Brook would have been a massive favour going to that fight at that time. Yeah. And this this time now it's still it's it's even more confusing how you see it. I sort of edge towards Khan, to be honest. I, 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 you know, if anything, maybe because of the way I, I wasn't very happy with watching Brook in his last fight 15 months ago against Crawford when he seemed to be hurt by by just about every punch. But then Khan hasn't fought for 31 months. Here's a little stat for you, Barry. When Amir Khan first won his world title, 2009 against Kotelnik, which was a brilliant performance. Uh, around that same time, around that very same time, Kel Brook was defending his British title against Stuart Elwell at York Hall. Oh, so oh. The, these two, the, these two, as much as they may have sparred together when they were babies, when they were teenagers, and as much as they may have eyed each other from ringside, Kel sitting next to the promoter, sorry, uh, Khan sitting next to the promoter and Kel a few rows back, these two were on very, very different paths for most of their career. I must just point out that there is a weight clause attached to this fight. <laughs> it's made officially at 149 pounds, which is two pounds over the world's weight limit, and it's into the light middleweight or super world's weight limit. But there is a rehydration clause. Uh, the next day, I'm not sure what time the next day, it's probably about 10 o'clock in the morning or it might be three in the afternoon, who knows? Uh, it will be, mo it's a movable feast, so to speak. They have to both weigh inside or weigh 163 and a half pounds, which is middleweight. Not a lot of middleweight, but it's middleweight. If you're a pound over, you have to pay the other guy 100,000 pounds. 100,000 pounds. It's a... Um, it, it, it's uh, it, it, it's it, Barry. It's a fun fight. I've got to be yeah. honest with you. I'm, I'm excited. I was. I, I would have preferred it in 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 2021. 20, but we've got it now, and and I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna kick this into touch. No, no but way. That, I'm loving this fight. What you just said about the about the weight the, the weight clause is that that just shows that Ami is the A side because the weight the weight clause will will benefit him more. And also, yeah. even though even though Cal Brooks earned plenty of money. It's not on the level what Khan has earned, of course. So Khan can probably afford to chuck a a, a, a couple of hundred grand down the drain and and wait and we're overweight and and Brook won't want to lose that money. And I think that's that's just him just going. Don't forget who's who's in charge here. And the fact that he's kept him waiting for so long, that's why I think he thought the fight's ready for me now. I think that's what he's done. He didn't need the fight, and that's the truth. But it's still a dangerous fight. If Cal Brook can you know, can 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 roll back the years a little bit. And he has that power. He does have that power. And he, and he always had that. And he has good timing as well. If he, if Amir Khan you know, goes out too fast and he walks onto a shot, then he's done. That's the truth. But I do think that he had the speed of Khan and the movement, because I think that's he always has that, I think will keep him out of trouble. Uh, you, you know what, Barry? There's one thing with this fight, and I say this to you all the time, you know I do, is that I might have an opinion now, five or six or seven <laughs> days out, but this week I'll be at the workouts, I'll be at the press conference, and I'll get a feel, I'll get a real feel. I'll get to look in their eyes. I'll get to see who actually looks like a 60-year-old man because sometimes that can happen, and I'll get to actually get a feel for it. So even if I make a prediction now, I might change it tomorrow <laughs> anyway. Those interviews are part of a Five Live Boxing special called Khan V. Brook, Finally Fighting. That's available on BBC Sounds. It also features a quick word from Eddie Hearn, uh, an in-depth interview with BMAC, Brian McIntyre, who now trains Amir Khan, also trains uh, Terence Crawford, Connor Ben and Dominic Ingle, who has been working with and training and friends with uh, Kel Brook since Kel Brook was about, I don't know, eight or nine years of age. That's available on BBC C sounds. Now, before I get a prediction from you, Barry, and I'm afraid we're both going to have to give a prediction, I've got an email here, and you can get us on email. It's quite simple. It's uh, five live boxing at bbc.co.uk, and you can either do it with the number five or the five letters. 
F-I-V-E. Hi, Steve. First time emailing in. Thanks for the weekly podcast. Always essential listening. Thank you very much indeed. How do you think the landscape looks for the winner of the Khan v. Brook fight? Does a win for either lead into a title conversation or has the time for these two at elite level passed and would they be better doing money stroke big fights until Eva hang up the gloves? I'll go first with this, Barry, because it involves Ben Shalom. Ben Shalom can make the winner of Khan Brook against Chris Eubank Jr. Just, Talk to me, Barry. Talk to me. <laughs> oh, mate. Uh, you know, I can see it as well. That's why I'm laughing because I'm just thinking, what are, you talking, what are you talking about? But actually, uh, it's realistic. You can see it, can't you? really can. I, I think the winner you know, should just go home happy that they've, they've got that big payday at the end of their career, another one, and they go home happily with a great career, but they won't because it has no relevance on the world scene in my mind, but it will because they're big names. So they'll, they'll, there's an opportunity for a title shot. But the Chris Eubank fight, but, but poor Chris Eubank, everyone wants him to come down and lose loads of weight all the time. No, listen, they'll, they'll, they'll go up to him. They can make it at 165. The, the winner of Kel Brook and Amir Khan uh, fights Chris Eubank Jr. You heard it here first. Hey, trust me, I'll get that from Ben Shalom on, on, on Saturday night. So, Barry, before I ask for your final prediction, I will grudgingly give mine. <laughs> Hard, tight fight. I really, I, I see this being a bit of a drain and a bit of a brawl, and I find it really hard for the pair of them. I think Amir will just about nick it, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if there's a stink. We might even see Khan v. Brook 2. Trust me. <laughs> what about you, Barry? I think it's a, I think it's a, a quite an exciting fight. I think Brook, I think Khan takes up a, a, a lead. I think he drops Brook first. Go on, Barry. I do. I think with the speed, I think he catches him out off balance. I think then, as the, as the rounds go on, in the middle rounds, Brook drops can. I got a massive prediction here, Steve. Brook bro- drops can twice, but still loses a points decision. My God! So, so the Khan drops Brook, and then Brook drops Khan twice, and still loses on points. That should be like a hundred and fifty to one. You should be able to put a grand down on that and retire for two years. Anyway, don't forget you heard it here first. So it's Amir Khan and it's Kel Brook in a fight that, hey, who cares if it should have been made five, six, seven years ago? It's sold out in six minutes. That's going to be a big fight. And people are talking about it. Everybody's talking about it. But in my opinion, they should be talking about the world title fight on the bill. 